Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name's Tim Besley, a member of the economics department here at the LSE. Uh, and I'm delighted to welcome you to this first uh, event of the LSE Festival, uh, where we're going to be uh, discussing uh, Manu Shafiq's new book, um, of which I am a proud owner of a copy here, uh, called What We Owe to Each Other, A New Social Contract. Uh, and I should note that Manoush has very kindly agreed to donate the royalties from her book to uh, studentships here at the LSE. Um, we're going to structure the event with this very distinguished panel who I will introduce in a moment, uh, with first of all me asking Manoush a few questions about the content of her book, and then bringing in our two distinguished panelists to debate the themes, the very important themes, I should say, in, in the book. Um, Manoush, of course, needs very little introduction, particularly in the LSE community, but she is, of course, director of LSE, and uh, um, many of you will, will know that she has held, prior to that, a, a number of very important policy positions at the World Bank, the DFID, IMF, and Bank of England. Uh, and I'm sure many of the ideas that she develops in the book were uh, acquired and, uh, and, and uh, came to her while she was serving in in, in those important roles. Uh, as I mentioned, we have two panelists. Uh, we have uh, President Juan Manuel Santos, uh, of, uh, who was president of Colombia from 2010 to 2018, and uh, uh, also a winner of the Nobel Peace Prize. Um, on his Wikipedia page, it says he's an economist by training and a journalist by trade, but of course, his extensive experience is much wider than that. And one should never uh, let go the, of the fact that he's also an LSE alumnus. Uh, uh, President Santos, welcome. Um, we will also be joined uh, by uh, Amartya Sen, uh, who's Lamont University professor uh, at Harvard, and also uh, a Nobel laureate, but in his case in economics, and a past member of the economics department here at the LSE. Um, so without further delay, um, I'll turn to the main proceedings uh, and start uh, with, with you, Manish, and perhaps invite you to begin by, by unpacking for the audience um, uh, the concept of a social contract. Not everybody probably is familiar with what you mean by that. And perhaps you can tell us a little bit while you're doing that, just where it connects to uh, LST's history, the idea of a social contract. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Tim. And uh, it's it's such an honor for me to have Juan Manuel and Amartya here, as well as you chairing this event. So by the social contract, I mean the norms and rules that govern how we live together and define what we owe each other in society. For example, are children raised at home by mothers or grandparents, or does the state provide ch childcare services? How much of healthcare is the responsibility of individuals and how much do we pay for collectively through either insurance or through public funding? Or do we expect employers to provide contracts with regular hours and benefits such as sick leave and pensions? Or do we expect workers and their families to carry the risks of illness and old age? In most traditional societies, what we owe each other in a society tends to be predominantly delivered by families and communities. In more modern societies, the state and the market play a bigger role. But what's true across all societies is that people are expected to contribute to the common good when they're adults in exchange for being looked after when they're young or when they're old or unable to support themselves. Now, this concept of the social contract has a long tradition at the LSE where thinking about the relationship between the economy and society uh, has a very long history, starting with the founders of the school, the Fabians, who created the LSE in 1895. And of course, the most famous product of that was the Beveridge Report, which was, which was actually written by one of my predecessors as director of LSE and published in 1942. And it fundamentally changed the social contract in the UK and redefined what citizens could expect from each other, including the creation of the National Health Service, uh, as well as a, a, a sort of consistent structure around unemployment and pensions protection. And that report was hugely influential in the developing world uh, in, in, in terms of post-colonial societies. I think the second 
sort of iteration of the social contract at the LSE came from Frederick Hayek, who was a professor at the school, another distinguished Nobel laureate, who published The Road to Serfdom, which was a reaction to the intervention estate proposed by Beveridge, which he thought risked taking us down the path of totalitarianism. Hayek, of course, laid the foundations for classic economic liberalism, and he left the LSE in 1950, went to the University of Chicago, where he was very close to Milton Friedman, and provided the intellectual foundations for what became known as the Chicago School, which of course was hugely influential with both Margaret Thatcher and Ronald Reagan, and influenced policy discussions throughout the 80s and the 90s. The third iteration of the social contract that came out of the LSE uh, was the so-called third way, uh, which tried to find somewhere in between the interventionist state of beverage and the laissez-faire market capitalism of Hayek. And my, another one of my predecessors, Anthony Gibbons, who was director of the school from 1997 to 2003, published a book entitled The Third Way in 1998, which reflected lots of work being done at the LSE about how you can make a market economy more socially compassionate and responsible. And those views were embraced by third way politicians around the world, including Bill Clinton in the US, Tony Blair in the UK, Lula in Brazil, Gerhard Schroeder in Germany, uh, and Thabo and Becky in South Africa. And I think Juan Manuel was also very actively involved in, in the third way of thinking. But the third way lost an enormous amount of credibility after the financial crisis in 2008, where its support diminished enormously as centrists were increasingly being replaced by populists around the world. And perhaps the culmination of that collapse of support for the third way happened in 2016 when we saw Trump being elected, Brexit, and the rise of populist politicians across the world. And in many ways, that was the motivation and context in which I started thinking about this book. Very interesting. So, Listening to that, could you tell us a little bit about how you see um, the building of a welfare state in particular and how, and how that fits into the idea of a social economy? Is that the same thing or is there something distinctively different about thinking of the role of the state through the lens of a social contract than the traditional view of the welfare state um, cradle to grave and, and, and all of that? How, how does that all work in your way of thinking? So. The social contract reflects all the ways that we organize things that we need delivered collectively, but that can be through many mechanisms, through our family, through our community, through our employer, or through the state. The welfare state is just one way of delivering collective goods. And you can think about it as, you know, childcare is a very good example. It can be done by the family, it can be done by the state. Uh, care for the elderly. Uh, again, can be done by families, can be done by voluntary organizations, employers might be required to provide insurance for old age care, or the state can organize old age care. So there are many possible mechanisms. The welfare state is, is one very important one, uh, which has become very, very uh, more prominent over the years. I think the other thing I'd say about the welfare state is that uh, there's a misconception that the welfare state is primarily about redistributing income from the rich to the poor. And what my colleague Nick Barr at LSE calls the Robin Hood function. Uh, but the main purpose of the welfare state is actually to redistribute income across our own lives, what's sometimes called the piggy bank function. So if you think about a clever child, a clever child can't go to a bank and say to the bank, I'm clever, I'd like to take a loan for you to fund my education and I'll pay you when I'm an adult. It's just not feasible. Instead, the state pays for that child's education with the expectation that when that child grows up, they will earn income, pay taxes, and then that will finance others to benefit from education. And so that intertemporal role of the welfare state in spreading uh, spreading income and, and managing risks across our own lives is actually the primary function of the welfare state and a key part of the social contract. And where do, where do families fit into this story? So, so traditionally, as you said, families 
uh, used to provide a lot of the functions that we now regard as part of the social contract. So does the social contract in a way displace the family or does it, how, how does that, how does that fit, fit together? Yeah. So in more traditional societies, the family is most of the social contract. Uh, in the most traditional societies, the family raises children, manages the risks around unemployment, ill health and old age. Uh, and when things go wrong, it completely depends on which family you happen to be born in, whether you have any social insurance. Um, does the social contract displace the family? I think the way I think about it more is that uh, some social contracts rely very heavily on families and other social contracts take many of those responsibilities and risks away from families because they think that there are more equal ways to share them. Uh, and so it, it, I wouldn't see it as displacement as much as more of where do you think that risk and those, and those responsibilities yeah. are best born in a society. So you provided a very eloquent account of how the social contract works, but I'm guessing you wouldn't have written the book if you hadn't thought that there were some issues and problems and challenges. So, um, so how, 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 what do you see as the, the issues? Would you even go as far as to say that the social contract is broken or is that too strong a term to use? I would say that, Tim. I would say the social contract is broken. If I describe the social contract as it was until the late 20th century. It was designed for a world in which families would have one sole male breadwinner, that it was presumed that women would take care of the young and the old. There was a presumption that people would stay married until they died and they would give birth to children only when they were married. And they would have steady employment with very few employers over a career. And that the skills that they got in school between the age of six-ish to 22-ish uh, would be enough for a lifetime. And that most people would only live a few years after they'd retired. And they would, if they needed support when they were old, that would be provided by families. And as I describe that social contract, which underpins the way most of our societies are still organized, you're probably thinking that has nothing to do with the society that I live in. In fact, today, half of women are employed in the labor market globally, and that trend is only going up. In most advanced economies, a third to half of marriages end in divorce. In most developing countries, the rates of divorce are going up. A growing proportion of children are being born outside of marriage. The average worker now has more jobs over the course of a lifetime and is much less connected to their employer. And technology will increase that. And while in many developing countries, uh, they're still transitioning to get more workers employed in the formal sector. We're seeing informality increasingly in the labor markets in many advanced economies with precarious work with very few benefits. And so the, the social contract which, which, which we have now is, high, is very irrelevant to the conditions in our societies. I think if I had to pinpoint what broke our social contract, I think there's two dr main drivers. One is the changing role of women. And so our entire system was premised on women taking care of the young and the old. And now that's very difficult because most women are working. And second, the role of technology and how technology has changed work and changed the relationship that most of us have to our employers. Uh, and, and, and that has been very fundamental. I think the last thing I'd say is just looking forward, there are two other huge factors that are threatening the social contract. One is aging. Uh, and what that will do to, uh, to the needs for care going forward. And second is climate change and how that affects the sustainability of our economies and our societies and our intergenerational social contract. So I'm interested that you didn't, you didn't mention uh, the pandemic at, at any point yet, but you were writing this book um, as the pandemic was unfolding. Um, so do, do, does, does the experience in, of the pandemic, does that contribute positively or, or negatively to the social contract? How do you see the, that, that playing out? Yeah, well, I started thinking about the book after 2016, as I said, and trying to understand why people were so angry in the world. Where was all this disaffection coming from? Why did four out of five people in the world think the system didn't work for them? 
And then the pandemic came. Uh, and I remember talking to uh, the editor at my publisher saying, oh my God, what do I do now? <laughs> But actually what I, what I discovered and what I think all of us have felt in this last year is that the pandemic just reveals the failings of our social contract even more. Who suffered the most? The people who were in precarious work, the poor, women. Uh, and what it showed is that those fragilities in our social contract were even more apparent. I often think of, the, of COVID as, as the great revealer. It revealed the frailties in our social contract. And I would argue that if we had a better social contract, uh, we, would, uh, we would have been in a much better position to deal with COVID. And before I bring in the other, the other members of the panel, I, it would be, we sort of need to turn now, I suppose, to the po the policy recommendations, if you like, the concrete policy recommendations that, that come out of your analysis. Uh, and of course, there are many in the book, so you, you, you won't have time to develop all of them. Perhaps you could just give one or two concrete examples of things that you would recommend um, to, to rebuild it in, in a way to, to fix the broken social contract as, as, as you see it. Well, so what I try and do in the book is go through the stages of life, uh, ranging from raising children to education, to healthcare, to work, to old age, and look at how in each of those areas our current social contract is broken and what a better one would look like. And I try and be really practical and give examples from countries around the world who, who are figuring out ways to do it better. So I'll give you an example from education and maybe one from work. In education, Society has made huge progress in getting most children into primary and secondary school, and most countries invest most of their resources in that area. But going forward, we know that we have huge inequalities in terms of educational outcomes and life prospects. And we also know that young people today are going to have much longer careers, maybe spanning 40, 50 years, because they will live much longer. Research shows from around the world that intervention very early, before children ever get to school, before the age of three, uh, has huge consequences. For example, a study in Jamaica showed that children who were visited by a community healthcare worker in, as infants once a week and, given, and the parents given advice on things like nutrition and play and mental stimulation of their children, those kids 20 years later were earning 42% more. And you can find similar research in places like Chicago and other, other, other countries. And what, you, what it tells us is that that early intervention, if families are supported before children get to school, that brain development of that child will have huge consequences for how much they can benefit from school and how much they will learn and earn over the course of their lives. Similarly, because careers will be longer, the idea that you don't fund education in adulthood uh, is highly foolish. And so I guess one, what I would argue is a better social contract would invest more in the early years where the possibilities to equalize opportunity for children are greatest and more in adult education where longer careers and technological change will mean that reskilling throughout life will be essential. So that's what a new social contract in education would look like. In the area of work, what I'd say is that because we're seeing growing informality in labor markets, both in developing countries and advanced economies. We have shifted so many risks onto individuals and we've seen it throughout COVID. Uh, those in precarious work were, were the most, uh, lost the most in terms of income. If they didn't have sick leave, they were afraid of not, of stopping work to, 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 to reduce the risk of transmission. I think we need to redress that. I think flexibility in labor markets is hugely important for efficiency and, 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 and economic dynamism. But that flexibility has come at a huge cost for workers and we need to increasingly think of a social contract where we retain the benefits of flexibility while providing workers with more security by mandating benefits for all workers, whether they're on a temporary contract, a gig contract, an informal sector uh, arrangement. Uh, and that means in developing countries, getting more workers in the formal sector and in advanced economies, making it a legal requirement that benefits such as sick leave and pension entitlements are given to all workers in proportion to the number of hours that they work. Thank you. I think it's time now to perhaps broaden out the, the conversation a little bit and bring in our, our two panelists. 
And uh, I, I, perhaps I could start with, with you, Amartya, um, uh, to perhaps uh, share with us a few of your thoughts about how, how the idea of a social contract fits into your framework for thinking about uh, justice and what a, what a good uh, society and economy would, would look like. How, how do you think about that in, in your thinking, Amartya? I think, um, no, I think, uh, let me say a couple of things. Um, firstly, I think both uh, Venusia's book is, was wonderfully illuminating in making us understand the extent of interdependences that we see in, in, in the world and how we can be in a much better position with the help of each person helping the other under a contract thing. Where I may have, where I do have questions to ask Venus, and uh, uh, without in any way compromising the understanding that I get from her work. You see, I think there are three things. One is there are respects in which we are so interdependent that each person can do more for others than other, than you can do for yourself in a in a in an isolated world. So the first point is interdependence. The second point is a mutuality of interdependence, that I do something for you, you do something for me, and that together works out much better. That's the basis of a contractual understanding. So far, all this is Hobbes, uh, and, 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 and the news, of course, but in a, in a much um, uh, more, uh, 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 in a much more total way. Then comes the final question, then the contract. I will do it provided you do it, and you tell me you will do it provided I do it. Now, there is a range of questions that people have been raising over the last thousands of years, uh, going back before Hobbes, as to whether that's the right way of thinking about it. I think the biggest question on that, I think, was raised by Gautam Buddha in, in a document called Sutta Nipata, where he discusses the question of why is it that the mother feels a responsibility towards the child, and he dismisses the idea, this is because he expects something from the child to be done for her, and finds the complicated things over, over age to be not acceptable, not the right way of thinking about it. It's just because the child needs it, you can do it, you ought to do it. You think it's a good thing to do, you ought to do it. And therefore, the argument is that if there are good things you can do for others, which you think are good, and they have a similar reason to think that, you should be able to do them without the contract. So what goes wrong is the Rousseauian, Hobbesian, uh, add of the contract to the mutuality uh, and uh, and uh, um, interdependent mutually interdependent what we had already arrived at. Now the question that arises is whether in a society that does need this mutuality, whether it's best done in terms of a rhetoric that goes in terms if I do that. Will you do that this for me? Mm. And this has had a huge hold in, I think, Western thinking, if I may be parochial in that, in the sense that uh, once Hobbes did that, and Rousseau did that, Locke did that, uh, that became the way of thinking about it. There was never anything like a spontaneity of doing it. I do it not because if I do it, that somebody else would do something for me. It, it, it could for course, but uh, I do it because it's the right thing to do. Now, what I want to know really is to how, what Minus is thinking on this is, because there is uh, the interdependence point, and this is where the book is totally, uh, I think, illuminating, namely how deeply interdependent these things are and see also brings an intergenerational thing. And, and, you know, to me, 
it reminded me very much of Sutta Nipata discussion by Buddha because he, you know, he, this is how you have to think about it, that we can do benefit to each other. Whether we do it contractually, I won't do it unless you do it for me. Mm. But that's the right, and his main point of Sutta Nipata is to say, that's the wrong way of thinking about it. Mm. And so that's the issue that I wanted to ask Minus about. I think we need the mutuality, we need the interdependence, and the question is how much the contractual way of thinking about it mm. helps in this or distracts. Okay, well, Manoush, over to you. Quite a quite a challenge there from Amacha. So, so yes. how, how, how would you like to respond? Yeah. So I I, I think that the contractual language is um, works better when you're talking about market-based and welfare state solutions. You know, people feel an obligation to pay taxes because everyone else is paying taxes and there are very clear benefits that are really contractually defined usually in legislation. It becomes a lot more fraught when you're thinking about families and communities. Uh, and, uh, and I understand why uh, that language is, is problematic. On the other hand, I guess I would say that in some domains, um, it's uh, not talking about it in a very tra the transparent language of contracts and social contracts uh, can uh, can make us hide a lot of hides a lot of sins. I mean, I'll give you the example, which I know Amartya has written extensively on, is um, is the division of labor in the household, for example. Now we don't talk about it as a contract, uh, and if no. you, you know, if you are in a household where you're all talking about the contracts that you have for each other, I think it would be a horrible place household to live in. <laughs> um, but on the other hand, you know, if you look at the time use studies, the fact is that, you know, women do two hours of unpaid work on average more than men, uh, and that has huge consequences for their employment prospects, for their income prospects, and for their old age. Um, and so you, you sometimes need to look at, um, look at, the f at, at it in a slightly contractual way to get at the underlying problem, which is that until we address the issues of having a more equal distribution of childcare, for example, we'll always have a wage gap. Uh, and that we'll always have highly unequal outcomes uh, and not be able to tap into all the talent of all of these women who've now become highly educated around the world. So I guess what I'd say is uh, we probably shouldn't use contractual language in our personal lives. I think that would be a miserable way to be. But I think from a public policy point of view, sometimes you have to, you have to, you have to look at it in that, using that framework. So perhaps a good time, we'll, we'll, we'll have a chance to continue this, this discussion, but I think it'd be a good moment to bring in uh, President Santos at this point. Um, and uh, I wonder whether, it, given your, your vast experience as a, as a, uh, in political life and in public life, um, how, how useful do you find the idea of a social contract as a way of defining the way uh, you would interact with yeah, with, with citizens in, in, as a political leader. Thank you. And uh, first of all, thank you very much uh, for having me in this very interesting and important event. And I want to congratulate uh, Minouj for a wonderful book. Good to see Amartya uh, once again. He was my professor many years ago and has been my inspiration uh, throughout my whole public life. And Professor Besley, thank you so much. And uh, Minush, thank you also because uh, you have helped me a lot in my present circumstances. We are having elections next year. And one of the problems we have in Colombia is that there are many candidates and they all come to me because I'm retired yes. to seek uh, new ideas. And uh, what I do is, look, read this book. You have all the ideas, that uh, interesting ideas and relevant ideas of uh, a better future, how to build a better future. Um, 
I would say that uh, there's a, a necessary complement to the book uh, in, in terms of speaking about a social contract uh, and defining a social contract as a relations between uh, individuals. And it's a, a social contract among nations also. We need that. Mm -hmm. We need a new social contract, mm -hmm. uh, how to relate each other as nations. And I think this pandemic has, uh, as you have said, has uh, uh, made us see the problems more clearly. And that's one of the problems, the multilateralism, uh, the institutions, they all need uh, to have a new, uh, new blood and new ideas. And uh, uh, social, the, the concept of a social uh, contract is uh, extremely powerful politically. And uh, this can also uh, uh, bring us an, a, a very, uh, very good opportunity right now in the world we're living almost every country is polarized uh, and uh, a discussion around the social contract uh, will tend to unite us, will tend to, if we can agree on the priorities that we need, uh, that would be a very good uh, basis for discussion politically and bring societies together. And you, you mentioned something in the book, Minush, uh, which is uh, very important, uh, how should we redefine concepts like progress? Uh, because uh, among nations uh, and within nations, for example, and you mentioned it, uh, GDP is uh, the indicator that, that uh, uh, defines success. Well, uh, Professor Sen, a long time ago, um, taught us that uh, that is not the most uh, important way to, to measure progress. Uh, he taught me, for example, in terms of poverty. Poverty is not how much you earn. Uh, poverty is multi-dimensional. And I, inspired by Professor Sen, uh, applied that in my country with tremendous success. And so I think that there's an opportunity today to, uh, around the concept of social contract and redefining uh, uh, the, what we mean by progress and bringing societies together to agree on that will be a tremendous engine, uh, political engine, and will allow us to at least mitigate uh, this tremendous polarization that we're in in, in today's world. Uh, the concepts are there, the ideas are there, and so uh, this is a, a book that has a lot of basis to start a discussion of that sort. And you, uh, Minouche, are fo is following, you're following the tradition of the LSE of bringing new ideas, new, uh, uh, new visions uh, in the correct moment. You, you mentioned the third way. The third way, uh, I was inspired by the third way. I applied the third way, and when you when you see how the countries applied the third, the country that applied the third way uh, at that time had the best performance socially and economically. Uh, why it came into disrepute, well, th that's another discussion, but I, I think something similar to the third way uh, that uh, can bring us together is extremely important. And uh, finally, I want to, to uh, emphasize something that you mentioned very importantly uh, in the in the book, uh, the importance of uh, early childhood. Um, I think there you you have a, a, a tremendous opportunity worldwide and within countries to make a, a much more effective effort mm -hmm. to address one of the terrible um, uh, consequences of this pandemic and the terrible problems that the world has had, which is the inequality. Inequality starts there. Exactly. And if you, if you do a much more effective effort within countries and around the world to give the child's uh, uh, a early start at the same level, this would be a very, very important step forward. And uh, lastly, uh, 
the the interdependence. Uh, the pandemic has showed us how interdependent we are. Uh, has showed us the the connection and the overlap between science, uh, between health, uh, and from then on, you, you you start seeing how kind of interdependence. So this phrase that has been so so much used with the pandemic, nobody is safe until everybody is safe. Uh, this is something that we have to uh, internalize. Uh, nobody is safe until everybody is safe in every respect, and most mostly with climate change, with the, the environment. Uh, I was having a panel this morning with some people that you, you you know very well, which are the the indigenous communities in the Amazon. Uh, and they are, have such an amount of knowledge about how to preserve the biodiversity in the Amazon. And the world should know that if you don't uh, protect the biodiversity of the Amazon, the world will not uh, exist for a long time. So uh, I finish with this, but I again congratulate you, Minush, for, for a wonderful book. Thank you very much, Manish. I don't know if you want to re respond to, to some of uh, what President Santos just said. Yes, I mean, just a couple of things. Uh, first, on how we measure progress. I mean, Amartya has, again, written a great deal about this, and, and, uh, and, and, and Juan Manuel has also uh, mentioned it. You know, it's a cliche that um, politicians uh, think that people vote on the basis of their pocketbook. And that you know, increasing GDP is going to be the way to get yourself elected. But actually, research at the LSE has shown that a better predictor of how people vote is their well-being. And if you look at measures of subjective well-being, those are a far better measure of the likelihood of a politician being elected than whether GDP has gone up during their tenure. And that message isn't out enough. I think uh, not enough politicians realize that taking that broader view of how citizens are doing is the right measure of progress. Uh, and I think if we got that message out, it would uh, it would it would change uh, change a lot of what current current thinking is. I think the second thing I said early childhood. I, I uh, you know when you look at the literature and the evidence here, it is so clear that that is the that is the most effective point for dealing with social mobility and the impact of those early years long before any child ever gets to school. And you know, if, if children don't get the right nutrition and mental stimulation in those early years, no matter how good a school you send them to, they'll never catch up. And it's also an incredibly low cost intervention. And that's one where, you know, we traditionally, we thought that was the responsibility of families. And so the state, or society didn't get involved in the early years. But I think when we see the huge consequences of not intervening, for, particularly for those children who are very vulnerable, uh, I think it's very hard to justify. Again, some very interesting research at LSE that uh, was headlined as the lost Einsteins showed that you know, children who happen to be born into a, into a poor family are held back massively in terms of their ability to innovate and as measured, for example, by having patents. And if you could get children from poor families and girls to innovate at the same rate as children who were born into wealthier families, you could quadruple the rate of innovation and patenting in, in our society. So the, the payoffs are potentially vast uh, and really justify a public intervention in, in the early years. I think the final point is just, I think both Amartya and Juan Mamela have, have emphasized interdependence in our societies. And the, and the pandemic has revealed that more than anything, any argument I could have possibly made. We are incredibly interdependent. And the, the polarization that we've seen in recent years uh, is a rejection of interdependence. And I think part of the point of this book is to reassert interdependence. Uh, and, uh, and I hope I've made a compelling case, partly on self-interest grounds, but also on a, on a wider, I hope, moral grounds for why uh, caring about the well-being of others is, is, uh, is the right thing to do. So let's, 
perhaps stay on that theme, and I'd like, love to go around the panel on this, on, on related to the theme of in, in, interdependence. Um, we, we, we have lived through an era, and I'm talking about for a couple of centuries at least, where the nation state has been the main way of delivering um, collective goods to citizens, the predominant way. And the social contract, when we think of it, generally we think of it in terms of a nation state um, serving its citizens. But many of the challenges, the challenges of interdependence that we're facing in the pandemic, the challenge of climate change, these are all cases where we for sure have to move beyond the, the nation state as the way of solving those challenges. So is, is there a danger that thinking in terms of a social contract naturally makes us think about strengthening a nation state and not thinking sufficiently about global solutions? Uh, I don't know who, I'm gonna ask all of the panelists to, mm -hmm. to think of, to, to give us their thoughts on that. I see President Santos has already indicated he'd like to, to, to respond. I think they're not mutually exclusive. You can have, you can have a, a, a social contract among nations at one level and social contracts within nations at a, another level. And I go even a, a bit further. The, this very interesting discussion about redefining progress where I know that uh, Professor Sen and other Nobel laureates of economics, uh, I think it's Stiglitz and uh, Krugman, are been discussing this, and the OECD has been discussing this. Uh, progress and the priorities to define progress differ from one nation to another. You can't have the same uh, set of priorities in Haiti than in Norway. Uh, so it's at a multiple level that I think, but the concept of social contract, I think, is applicable to all these levels. And uh, therefore, they're, they're, they're not uh, contradictory. I would say they complement each other. Amacha, I don't know if you want to, to, to comment on that. Who are you asking me? Hi. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, I think that's just, it's a very good question. You know, and I think the I think that one of the great things about Minutia's book is the, the importance of the examples that she considers, whether you're dealing with early childhood or intergeneration thing. These are very important connections, which we often miss out. And whether we think of them in terms of social contract or about mutual interdependence, and I would like to uh, think of it as mutual interdependence, and uh, I think they are, should be important. Now, in terms of the going towards the nation, but thus far no further, uh, that question, Tim, that you raised, uh, has a great importance. Let's take one example that um, uh, connected with this country, as it happened to LSE, in fact, too. Is the, um, during the Second World War, um, because food was um, threatened by the war, uh, Britain wasn't getting its supply, uh, suddenly the British decided to have rationing and control. Low food prices in order to prevent a famine or a hunger. One result of it was that suddenly people were getting food at a price that they had never had as low a price as before, as happened during the war. The result was a dramatic change in the in in the well-being. The the in the decade preceding the the war decade, the forties, um, the men's life expectancy increased by about uh, uh, one year, and but during this period it went up by six and a half years. And for women, it went up by seven years. And then there was, on the basis of that, there was a kind of recognition, and I think the best discussion of that is the book by Hammond, R.J. Hammond called Food, History of the Second World War, Food, how suddenly it recognized that with a little effort, the country 
could be in a much, much better position. And the same thing happened with, with the medicine situation. So, uh, and the National Health Service was born, beverage was coming up at that time. So the result was that there was a kind of understanding of a national interdependence and commitment to each other, which made the welfare state of Europe possible. I mean, people like Bismarck had talked about it vaguely, but it's that period that came in and that was a move from the individual to the nation, I mentioned the LSE, because a lot of the people who are working on it are the Hammond, Titmus, Abel, Brian, Abel, Smith. Mm -hmm. They were always, either they were at the LSE or they were connected with it. So there was a big movement from the individual to the nation. And organizations like Oxfam, which was born shortly thereafter, was to say that this could surely be extended to the world. So there is a kind of gradational thing, individual, the nation, the world. And in there's no particular reason why the nation interfere. I mean, you were a bit concerned whether it might just go there and stop. And the, it's a question, it seems to me that if we don't see it as a social contract way, not a contractual thing, but an interdependence way that we all depend on each other. And we, I mean, this is not a exceptionally new thing. I mean, it's, it is what the Good Samaritan story of Luke is about, about, you know, you find a wounded man, you ought to do something and you decide to do it, even though the neighbors won't do it. And even though you come from a far away place, uh, Samaritan, and this is all in the form of an argument between Jesus and a lawyer that was going on. And the question that Jesus asked at the end, when this wounded man wakes up, who did he think was his relation? And the lawyer had to concede that he will think that the that far away man from Samaritan was in fact his, his relation. So I think there, there is a kind of movement from one layer of understanding our closeness to a, a bigger layer. And I think among the things that Minouche's book outlined is that they given the importance of interdependence, if we don't go in the direction of, uh, let's do a contractual obligation, by the way, the Samaritan didn't have any contractual obligation. He did it because he found a wounded person and we needed help. And it's exactly the same story as we're just talking about a baby needing help. Uh, or, or, or Hammond talking about that you can do an enormous amount for nutrition and medical care if you take an interest in each other. So that there, there is a kind of layer of the story. And I think the, to, the, to the extent that the Venusian book is the beginning of a line of research, and after all, this is at least we just beginning a festival, I think, right now. Is that not right? That, this is a festival this is, right. <laughs> this is a good moment to 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 think about it and seeing how opposite movements have occurred. Uh, and I hear as an Indian have to say how much we have slipped, for example, in India, uh, you know, from that interdependence picture with which the country became independent. And there we were giving lectures on the on the night of the on the, uh, of the of independence coming to India to a situation where you don't do it at all. That is, you decide to have a lockout, lockdown, which is good, but you give people four hours notice and you tell people that I'm so sorry, says the prime minister, you have to be in your home. I'm very sorry to confine you. And he's giving lecturing to people who actually don't have a home. Uh, he loved telling to people who, whose only means of survival will go if you suddenly stop uh, all contact so that you can't have employment, you can't have an economy going. So we, we have a danger of going, taking the wrong uh, direction 
and we have the enormous opportunity of taking the right direction uh, and 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 see our interdependence in a broader light and how much it could help uh, uh, each other. So I think um, Minus is sitting there in the middle of this tremendous understanding about the nature of humanity. <laughs> and I think this is, and, and uh, no one has probably thought as much as President Santos has in, uh, in, in thinking about how to apply that interdependent notion in the, in the world that we happen to live in. And Venus has enormously um, expanded our understanding of that. So that's the way, Tim, I would take your question in that direction. Thank you very much. Manoush, would you like to come in on that theme of the, the nation state versus global um, social contracts? Yeah. I think, um, you know, climate change is a really good example of that tension. Um, and uh, I, I think, uh, you know, if you think about it as an intergenerational social contract, uh, you know, the climate is obviously a shared good. No country can like have its own little climate. Um, and, um, and it's a really good example of where thinking about the obligations to future generations uh, should, uh, should factor into our decision-making. Um, one of the things when I was writing the book, I was trying to think about, uh, you know, when you think about private goods, people can look after their own grandchildren or great grandchildren, but only in some domains. Uh, and in other domains, you, uh, you know, those grandchildren and great, and great grandchildren will, will inhabit the same climate as a poor person halfway around the world's great grandchildren will. And so you have to care about the, the wider interdependence. Uh, and you also need to care about other people's grandchildren. Uh, because they will cohabitate the society that your children, your grandchildren will live in. Uh, and so I think that that sense of interdependence is cross-border, not just when you're talking about cross-border goods like the climate or a pandemic, uh, but also about what kind of world future generations will inhabit. And you do have to, you do have to care about the well-being of those who don't happen to reside within the boundaries of your own nation state. Thank you. Um, so, so I'm now I've been monitoring the chat and seeing the kinds of questions that are coming up. Actually, that question, interestingly, was mirrored in the chat. But one, one thing we haven't touched on, um, and I think is a, is is a is a good sort of application of your ideas is where does populism fit into this? Is thinking of the world in as a kind of social contract an antidote to populism? Um, uh, but obviously, it's something that many people are concerned about and what we're particularly concerned about it pre-pandemic and probably will be um, even afterwards. So, so mm -hmm. is there anything that your framework of analysis can, can, can say about populism? And of course, I'll come to President Santos in a minute and who, who I'm sure has, has a perspective on, on, on this too. So yeah, um, absolutely. Um, absolutely. I mean, I think in some ways, sub, part of the initial motive of writing this book was a bit of a reaction to populism, which is about, uh, you know, which is a style of politics, uh, which is highly, uh, which builds on anger and disaffection and blaming others who are different, uh, a bit of xenophobia with a bit of nationalism thrown in. Um, and, and in some ways, Part of what I'm arguing is that um, is that that way of thinking is uh, is deeply misguided, and that we owe each other much more, and that uh, that the that thinking about you know collective collective interdependence, uh, both within the nation state and 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 beyond that, is uh, is a key part of economic success. Um, and so I would like to think that the philosophy underpinning the book in terms of particularly the policy recommendations are, um, are, uh, are a way to address the legitimate grievances that populism raises. I mean, underneath 
the style of politics are a set of legitimate grievances, grievances about inequality, about lack of opportunity, particularly lack of opportunity. And I, I think one of the things that the policy recommendation in the book tries to address is how do you, how do you fix the architecture of opportunity in a society? How do you create a fairer architecture of opportunity? And, and populists, um, populists thrive on fueling a sense that the architecture of opportunity, yeah, the system is rigged, it's corrupt, it's, uh, uh, you know, you were had, you were cheated. Um, and what I'd like to do is to think about how do you create a world in which that, those sentiments can't be exploited because the architecture of opportunity is fairer and results in more equal, equal outcomes. So, President Santos, your, your perspective on populism and the social contract. Well, uh, I think the, the most effective vaccine against populism is to empower people, to allow people to feel that they are uh, being taken care of or being uh, at least heard. Mm. Populism feeds on fear and envy and uh, if you if you give people at least the chance to participate that will at least uh, diminish the possibility of populism and i think discussing around the social contract or around a new definition of progress uh, for example uh, you go to a, a country x colombia uh, we have a a list of, of basic needs. Uh, people want X, Y, and Z. Well, how are we going to prioritize that? Bring them in into the discussion. And uh, then once we agree on something on this list of what we need, that will be the indicator that uh, uh, will be used to measure success. And uh, you will be, uh, any government and any leader will be uh, measured how much have we made progress with this indicator. The indicator could ha could uh, include how much, how many uh, tons of uh, uh, of emissions are we saving? Uh, how much did we uh, decrease the inequality? Uh, how many uh, hectares of uh, uh, tropical forest have we been able to uh, replant? Uh, or how many people are uh, covered by the health system. It's it's a completely new indicator. But once you we have this indicator, the same as today, we say that, uh, for example, Chile is the most successful country in Latin America because the GDP has been in the last 10 years the highest. Well, we have to reshuffle that. But what I want to say is that the discussion around that new definitions of a social contract and the and what this could uh, include will be a good uh, way to avoid populism. Uh, Amartya, I'm sure you've thought a lot in, in particularly no, recent I, years I, I, and I, what's I, going I, on in I, India. Uh, uh, what uh, one man will say. And uh, uh, it's not a question of, you see, I think populism has two elements in it. The, uh, you know, it is something to do with people, populism, even derivatively has that feature, and yet it could be very misleading. And uh, I can't get away from my country because their examples come so plentifully in the decline that we are seeing all around in, 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 in my own nation, of which of course otherwise I'm proud. It's just that what began as, think of Gandhi and so on, what was Gandhi's contribution to, to, to India? It is that he suddenly found it possible that common people could drop other things and look for something which have both on one side independent from colonial rule and on the other side trying to eliminate terrible injustices like the caste system and so on. Um, and the, the, and he succeeded in doing it. And now over time, 
it, it became clear that the focus could be different. And the and and the guy I always refer to whenever I come to LSE, since he was an LSE student, and you have a statue of him here, namely Dr. Amvedkar, who did his PhD here, uh, thought that Gandhi's emphasis wasn't quite right because uh, there should have been much more on the inequality issue than he had. Gandhiji was anti anti inequality. On the other hand. It's a question of focus. Now, as the focus has moved, and it has, um, instead of it being popular and connected with people and democracy, it's increasingly used democracy as a way of, um, of um, um, establishing power, winning elections, and as uh, happened in the case of um, say Mrs. Tasha and the Falklands, we know that if there is a bit of war going on, then that actually would make you win an election, as indeed it helped Mrs. Tasha certainly to win the Falkland War, certainly change the, the arithmetic of the popular uh, aspect of democracy, namely uh, who is going to win the election. And I think something similar happened. I mean, that, therefore, the kind of um, thing that we saw in India, including increase in hostility with Pakistan, as well as within uh, the country, uh, getting history out and saying, these people had done a lot of harm to us 500 years ago and so on. It changed the talk. So I think we are in the, a kind of danger spot there the pop of the people aspect of popularism sitting quite close to the pop of the democratic access of popular democracy. And we have to be extremely careful to, to look at that. And I think one of the reasons why um, the, uh, the point that um, uh, the President Santos was making is so important is that uh, you can't dissociate them. You just can't say this is just um, this is just populism. Uh, you have to say, well, if that's the case, then why has it been successful? Mm. What has it done, and so on. And so we have to keep that total picture. And uh, interdependence is a very big part of, of this thing. The, uh, what's happened. I think the Indian poor situation it worsened a lot. The, the latest studies that we get from India, the, the uh, undernourishment of children has dramatically increased over the last few years. Why so in a country that has been having quite regular progress until recently it was one of the fastest growing economies in the world. What's gone wrong? So it's the question of attention. And I, I, I must say, in, to the extent that I would try to push minutia on one side, I would like that interdependence aspect, which of course uh, um, uh, uh, President Santos is also emphasizing, push that much more. And the contractual aspect, tit for tat, you do this, I will do that. Mm -hmm. Which I think is not a good way of thinking about human relations. And it's not a good way of making progress. And it can have real harm. So, so when you just coming, I'd, I'd love to put, put that point to you. Uh, it, it, are, we, are you seeking through your book to change the way people think? And in particular, do you, is it your, would you like people to think more contractually or more in the way Amartya would like people to think in terms of the, what we, Owe each other, but without thinking of what we're getting in return, yeah. um, it, it is part of the agenda to create a, a, a better set of values, if you like, among among people uh, as well. Yeah, I mean, I th yes, I think the answer to that is yes. I think um, the sort of uh, the sort of values that are underpinning the the kind of set of policy proposals, I think, are three in the book. One is that um, 
everybody deserves a minimum, a minimum below which no one should fall in a society. Uh, and I, I'm not a fan of universal basic income. We can talk about that if you like, but, but in developing countries, you know, cash transfer schemes to keep people above a, a floor is, is, is very feasible in, in virtually every country in the world. And hundreds of countries have now implemented them. And in advanced economies, to protect those who's, who, you know, through tax credits uh, to, to maintain a minimum. That minimum should also include a minimum access to healthcare and to avoid destitution in old age. Uh, so minimum social pensions for the, for the elderly. Uh, so that's principle one, I think, that underpins uh, the, the thinking. The second is uh, investing much more in capability and opportunity. And this, you know, is something, again, Amartya has written a great deal about the importance of capability to have a good life. Uh, and the argument I make in the book is that we, we underinvest in each other's capability massively, be it in education, lifelong learning, uh, and, so, and, and so on. So I think that the early years stuff, so maximizing investment in capability so that the talent in our societies can be properly used to the wider benefit. And the third principle is sharing risks a little bit differently. Um, I mean, things like populism uh, tap into people's insecurities because so many risks are being borne by individuals. Um, I, the bumper sticker version is, uh, you know, we need societies that are less about me and more about we. And, and so many of the risks that I can think of are not being borne in the right place. You know, think about the risk around, the risks around, you know, old age. We could solve those risks through requiring insurance, people have insurance when they get old or insisting that there's a, a minimum state pension so that the elderly don't face destitution. Those risks should not be borne exclusively by individuals and families. Uh, similarly, the risks of unemployment. Uh, you know, so much of uh, what we describe as populism is associated with parts of countries in which people's employment prospects have diminished and they feel like they have been cheated of the future. Uh, but, but most societies terribly underinvest in reskilling and helping people find new jobs. And yet it is feasible to do that in countries that do invest properly in that, create more secure societies. Um, and so I think those three principles, a minimum for all maximum investment in capability and better sharing of risks among us, recognizing that all of us could end up anywhere in society and, uh, and we want, to, we want to end up with a society that would be one in which no matter where we ended up, we would feel we were treated justly. Thank you. So um, can I invite you to, to think about how the ideas in your book uh, apply uh, uh, to uh, the relationship between universities and their students? Right. Um, you obviously have in your day job uh, a lot of experience with that. And there is a sort of social contract. I'm sure you'll 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 see. Uh, and and that in current circumstances is is proving difficult because of just you know, very challenging conditions. Do you do you have any reflections on how you might apply the ideas in your book to your to your day job? In my day job. Well, it's funny you say that because I have thought about some of the challenges in my day job in the context of the social contract. Um, so, for example. Uh, because of COVID, uh, we had to try and deliver the best educational experience we could, but with extreme constraints in terms of human contact. Um, so in order to persuade our faculty, who are, to be frank, mainly of a demographic that is relatively vulnerable to COVID, i.e. older, um, <laughs> we had to make sure that we had a fantastic testing regime on campus so that everyone would be tested. Uh, and, you know, I'm doing my, this event today from, from, uh, from my office and um, I had a COVID test before we started this morning to make sure that it would be secure. So that was part of the social contract. The other bit of the social contract was that our students have done a fantastic job of wearing masks, getting tested and doing social distancing. And as a result of that, in the autumn term, we were able to continue to teach in person uh, in a way that most other universities were unable to do because different parts of our community kept their bit of the social contract. The faculty came in to teach because they knew that 
the students were going to be wearing masks and everyone on campus would be tested and we had a tracking regime. We had other dilemmas like, for example, uh, when the lockdown was imposed, many students went home and were no longer able to uh, to take up their, their halls of residence and their rooms in their halls of residence. And so we, we reimbursed the fund, the students who were no longer using that hall of residence uh, if, they were, if they went home as a result of COVID. Um, unfortunately, the LSE doesn't control all the landlords in London, so we weren't able to, do, to, to have an impact on private landlords, but we were able, at least within our own community, to make sure that we handle things fairly. Uh, as a result of that, what I would think of was a pretty good social contract on the LSE campus, uh, we had very few COVID cases uh, and we didn't have an outbreak, which many other universities had to struggle with um, because everyone did their bit. And I guess uh, pointing to Amartya's point, they didn't do that bit. I mean, yeah, we did make people sign up, you know, when the students have to sign up to a code of conduct and that kind of thing. So yes, there was a little bit of a contract there, but it was really the spirit of it that I think kept everybody uh, kept everybody adhering to to rules which meant that we were all better off and um, so for me that was a, a a microcosm of what we might be able to do in a better society where everyone does their part and and perhaps as a, a last point because time, time is ticking um, obviously times of stress and sadness like the ones we're going through with the pandemic can also be times of, of opportunity to, to make changes which otherwise would appear very difficult. Um, so are you, are you optimistic about, perhaps ask all three panelists, are you optimistic or, or pessimistic that we'll seize the opportunity to, to make positive changes as a consequence of the pandemic? And, and what should be, in your view, the really guiding principle for making those changes so that they are sustained and effective? Uh, and let me come to President Santos and Amartya and then the last word to Manoush. Okay. Well, I, I am optimistic. And I think this pandemic uh, has given us many opportunities. Uh, the first thing I would say is that it has brought science to the level that we should always have science and hear uh, mm -hmm. science in our decisions. Second, it has shown us that we are much more interdependent. And that is extremely important, that we need each other. And that we live in one house, which is our planet, and that we are all one race, which is the human race. And that we not only have to have peace among us, but peace with nature. And that aspect is extremely important, peace with nature. And by uh, being together, because the pandemic is the first time that, that all the human beings get together to solve one single problem, and we so are solving it in a very uh, fast way, with much more effectiveness than we thought at the beginning. Remember, vaccines will take years, well, it took months. Uh, and so this is a, a good first step to address the other problems, especially climate change in order to be able to have a better future. And under the, underneath that, uh, we can apply uh, what uh, Manoush so eloquently uh, says in her book, uh, a social contract uh, within nations at a different levels and among nations. Thank you. Amacha, what, what's your reflection uh, on the challenges? I very much agree with uh, what uh, basically Santos said just now. But um, I think it depends on this, that when we have a problem like the pandemic now, and I was giving the example of, of war, that was a similar situation when Britain didn't know whether it can get food in. And, uh, you know, the German submarines were all around and so on. There was a, it's a trying time. And yet out of that came rapid increase of life expectancy, a national health service, and the welfare state and beverage. Now, this the connection is that in that context, the fighting brought out 
a kind of need for thinking about each other. Um, in the Hammond book I referred to, History of Second World War, called On Food, he, uh, there's a chapter where he asks the question, when is it that the ruling classes in Britain decided that they have an obligation to uh, for nutrition of everyone in the nation. And the war helped in that. Now, I think the same thing could have been true of the pandemic that they all work together and to some extent it has. And yet the divisions became in many ways bigger. Chicago may have uh, uh, 20% black people, what 70% of the COVID victims may be black, African American. And the when the divisions are very unequal, and that has been a big problem, including the problem that there is a deep suspicion of vaccines on the part of communities that feel that they have not been rightly treated by other communities it tends to divert people rather than convert them. So I think much depended on how it's being treated. And then I get upset about countries. It's not just India. I'm giving a example from India because I, it's easier for me to know them. Uh, it's just that when there is a clear asymmetry, clear injustice, that tends to not get people closer together, but to get them uh, further away. Uh, I think one of the points that Ambedkar, who I was referring to, uh, the great LSE, uh, a sociologist, economist, um, uh, unfortunately, when he was studying the subject called sociology wasn't invented, uh, but otherwise he would be called a sociologist. <laughs> Uh, the, his find was that in the process of fighting for liberation, for independence from Britain, and in the process of dealing with poverty, if the focus is only on some people and not others, then it may have exactly the opposite effect of, of a, 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 a general war in which everyone in the nation is on the same side. Mm. So I think it depends much on, it depends not only on the nature of the crisis, but how we deal with the crisis. Mm. And we have messed it a, quite a bit already. And uh, we should make sure that we don't mess it more. Mm. Unfortunately, America was under a regime where that way of thinking uh, wasn't uh, at all encouraged from the from the uh, headquarters of the country, as it were. But um, things could change, and things have changed. And I think the, um, the big example, I mean, the connection between between the war and the welfare European welfare state, the connection between what happened to East Asia just after the war and the experience during the war, including all the other things like the long march of multitude to the north. Uh, how are they connected? These connections are really important. And, uh, and I think um, there's a lot of, there's no, I mean, I feel very much, uh, associated with LSE since it has been uh, in it, though I've never a student here, been my institutional connection for a very, very long time. Um, the, the, uh, there's no better place than LSE to, to give this understanding to the world, how our way of handling our problems also marks what kind of a future we might try to get, and I'm delighted, Tim, that you raised the question, because it's uh, very much a question that we address, and I think LSE should address as the 
premier institution of academic thinking in the world. <laughs> Thank you. So the last word to, to you, Manoush, on, on that. I don't know if you want to, to add anything. Yeah, all I'd say is I, I think like Juan Manuel and Amartya, I'm, I'm optimistic, but I recognize it depends. I'm, uh, it depends because in other critical junctures in history, sometimes you have a crisis and people make brave decisions and things get better, like after World War II or, uh, or after the Great Depression. But sometimes people make decisions and actually things get worse, like after World War I or the 2008 financial crisis. And so I, it could go either way. But there are some reasons I think that this pandemic will fundamentally change politics. I saw the results of a very interesting survey in 24 countries. And what it found was that since the pandemic, people feel more afraid. They feel let down by society. Uh, and they're pessimistic, which is not good. But on the other hand, the deprivation of human contact has also made people value social solidarity and equality and community and self-determination and freedom. And I think if we have leaders who tap into those, those feelings that people have in the wake of the pandemic, our politics could become very, very different. And so I think there's an opportunity. And the reason I wrote this book is that I, I hope that at least some of these ideas are useful in at this critical juncture, pushing us in the direction away from fear and hostility and feeling let down by society and more in the direction of social solidarity, equality, community, and freedom. Thank you very much. And let me just remind you again uh, that we're here to, to celebrate the publication of Minutia's book. In fact, you'll see that on the slide. So it only remains for me to, to thank uh, our superb panel, um, Manoush, of course, for writing the book, but also for sharing her ideas. President Santos for bringing his extensive experience as, as a statesman and also uh, as a, evidently someone who's thought very, very hard about all of the issues in, uh, in uh, Manoush's book. And of course, Amartya also, who spent a, a lifetime um, puzzling over many of the biggest challenges that we face uh, in society and uh, for sharing his thoughts too about uh, uh, the, the ideas of Minister's book. A wonderful LSE occasion, a fitting opening for the LSE festival. So thank you so much to everyone for joining us. And I hope you've enjoyed this event as much as I have. I'm sure you have. Um, and good evening and thank you for joining.